that obviously after your presentation because okay. you'll be good doing a yep. group thing and they'll be doing that as well. Yep. Um, and you've got the mic and, and are, are we coming back at the end then to to do a summary with any further comments or questions people want to make or not? I think I think that would be an, would be. Are you well? Yes, I'm well. Thank you. Good. You're looking well. Hello, everybody. Oh, hello, everybody. I'll manage my voice. If you if you're getting a drink, then please continue to get one. Um, get one for me as well, and then find a seat. So thanks very much for giving up some time this afternoon to come along to what's now the third presentation uh, that we've been doing across the campuses, and uh, welcome to those in London who are. I believe live streaming in, but uh, we can't see you, but, but welcome London as well. I'm going to go through a presentation which has taken me so far about 30 minutes each time, and then after that we're going to stay in your, in your table sessions where there's a facilitator on each table who will uh, take you through a range of topics and questions and things that you may want to raise. So if there are things that come up during the presentation you want to ask questions about, then I'll stop at the end to give you a chance to do that but then we'll uh, break into the table groups and have a conversation at that level. So, a little bit of history, not, not too far back, but we set up a new corporate strategy, Dream, Believe, Achieve, uh, just a, a couple of years back, um, 2014. We're in the process of refreshing it right at this moment, and I think later this week it will be available um, in PDF version on the web and a few hard copies that we'll distribute around. It's the same strategy. Uh, it's focused itself into three broad themes, student experience, research and enterprise, and global reach, and underpinned by the, the sustainability that the university needs to have and the people's strategy for the university. So we think it's uh, uh, a useful refresh, and I'm sure when you see it, you'll make your own observations of that yourself. Now, what are universities good for? <laughs> well, I hope you all have your own personal opinion on that, but... I broadly categorise universities here to do three things. One is to educate people, and in, in doing that, transform lives, and we do that exceptionally well. One is to generate research, 
which we also do quite well, add to the body of knowledge. And the third is to innovate, use the knowledge and the capability of the staff and the research that we produce to create a difference in the local, national and international economies in which we find ourselves interacting. And UWS is doing a pretty good job in all three of those areas. Our purpose, and a lot of words on this slide, I'm not going to go through them all, but our purpose is, I think, quite nicely described here. Uh, we're a university located in the south and west of Scotland, four campuses, a uh, campus in London, and a global reach which is expanding. Uh, there are students that come from more than 80 countries studying at UWS, and similarly there are staff from across the world who work in the university. So we really are creating a global brand here with some very clear aspirations for our local communities, for those communities across Scotland, the rest of the UK and worldwide. And that's articulated here in what we see our purpose being. I'll spend a little bit of time on this slide because I think it tells a very compelling picture. If we identify student success as one of the aspirations a corporate strategy has, and there are a number of different items here that I'm highlighting, if we look at retention, and you see the retention figures here, the latest data shows that 17.8% of our students don't complete the award that they came to do. But that's against a backdrop which in 11, 12 and 12, 13 was above 30%. And that, at the time, placed us as number one in that league table. We had the worst dropout of any university in the UK. We're now not the worst university in the UK with dropout. We've improved four positions, and I'm delighted about that. The target that we are trying to aspire to here is about 7%. That's typical of modern universities, so about 7% of the students who don't complete. So what I'm pleased about is that there's been a positive improvement for each of the past four years. You can compare that against an income increase. You can compare that against a national student survey improvement, against a postgraduate taught survey improvement against the number of first and two ones the university is awarding going up and the percentage broadly going up over that time and graduate destination figures also improving in a positive direction. So that's a, an unbelievably positive story about UWS over the past few years and I want to give you my personal thanks and gratitude for the work that you've done in helping that happen. This is what the university must continue to do. All those metrics have got to improve. And when they do improve, we see unbelievable alternative outcomes from that, which I'll touch on in just a moment. One of the things I wanted to spend a little bit of time on in this presentation is talking with you about what I think sport does for the university and why I believe it's important. And it's not because my academic subject is sports psychology. My first degree is in chemistry, by the way. Um, but sport is fundamentally important to a university. If you go and look up this research publication here in 2013, which identified 6,000 students in the UK higher education system, what you find is that students who engage in sport during their time at university tend to end up getting more or higher graduate salaries than those students that don't. Now, I don't know if that's a cause and effect or a correlation, but it doesn't matter. 6,000 students is quite a compelling number. But it is known, it is proven that students will end up with higher paid jobs if they've played sport during their university time. Now, I'm not telling you we should go and say to every student, play sport. What I am saying is we want students to engage in activities, whether that's a club, a society, a sport, during their time here, which enriches them. It improves their graduate attributes. It develops their skills. It's something which can go on there here. It's a way of ensuring that, in addition to the academic content of their degree program, they've got other skills and things which will be attractive to employers. And there are other things as well. UWS, when I arrived here, wasn't freeing up timetabling on Wednesday afternoon for our students to participate in sport. And one of the things I wanted to do was free up that Wednesday afternoon where possible, let students who wanted to play sport for the university do that, and I'll show you some figures in a moment. And then we created a, a head of sport role held by Kieran, who's in the room here somewhere. Kieran, put your hand up. Okay, so those of you who don't know Kieran, Kieran heads up sport here. And I gave Kieran a challenging task. I said, Kieran, this is what I want to do. I want you to help us improve our performance in Bucks, the British universities and colleges sport. 
We were ranked in the 140s when I arrived here. And I said, I want to be inside the top 50. I said, I want a facility strategy so that we've got sporting provision on every campus of the university. I said, I want you to um, create the opportunity for external sponsors to come in and, and see investing in sport in the university as something that they want to do. And I want a scholarship program which attracts students here because of the way in which we engage in sport and give them an opportunity to participate. So where have we got to in terms of partnerships? These are some of the partnerships that we have in sport. Scottish Rugby have endorsed us as a university where if you want to play rugby for Scotland, if you come to UWS, they'll support you. And we have a relationship with their rugby club. Scottish Swimming, and I'm sure this is partly out of the background that Kieran comes with because he used to work for British Swimming. We've got some outstanding swimmers at the university now who are doing wonderful things for us in terms of Bucks Points. Just down the road, the most successful hockey club in Europe. We are now involved with Netball Scotland and the Sirens team who played their fifth match in the current series at the weekend. They've had uh, two wins and three losses, but they're doing quite well for a first year in. St Mirren Football Club, again, who won at the weekend. Unfortunately, so did Air. <laughs> I'll have to say it differently when I go to Air later this week. <laughs> um, we do hope that they will stay in this league, but there's a few more points to be gained yet. And of course, Brayhead Clan, the ice hockey team, that we also have relationships with. Now, that's not all of them. We have other relationships as well, but these are some quite high-profile relationships we have where students are playing with these clubs and studying with us. We've got some high-performing athletes. That chap there, Callum Hawkins, is a student of ours studying in computing and engineering. He's a marathon runner. He represented the UK at last year's Rio Olympics. He finished ninth in the marathon, but led for a period of time when BBC commentators gratefully and without any coercion from us, uh, highlighted the fact that Callum Hawkins is a student at the University of the West of Scotland. So we got some pretty significant international profiling from Callum's efforts. And what I was additionally delighted about was um, earlier this year when the uh, Edinburgh Cross Country Run was on, Kieran led for most of that race. For those of you that may have watched that on TV, it was live telecast. Kieran led for most of the race. Again, we got some profile. Sorry, Ca Callum. Um, <laughs> Um, and uh, unfortunately he was beaten on the line or near enough to the line in the last 50 metres but what I was particularly proud of was that uh, he beat uh, uh, the outstanding Samo Farah by over a minute and a half who was also in that race so it was a, a, a big one-upmanship for the university and for Callum. He's got a great future ahead of him. Craig McNally joined us last year, won a huge number of uh, points for us this year in Bucks and some of the other teams that are doing quite well in our Bucks competition. So this is what we're trying to do here, is get this blue line to go up and get the red line to go down. So the red line is the overall ranking. You can see the performance over the past few years. Uh, when I looked at this last week, we were actually 99th. The points keep changing regularly. 98th today. So it goes up and down because there are points being acquired every weekend and every week uh, in the university system. So, so we, we're, we're lying uh, 98th, as, as Kieran said, and our points are going up. So you can see them going up here. So that's what we're trying to do, but then look at how this compares. So if we want to get inside the top 50, which is what I said we do, currently the University of South Wales last year finished 50th with 704 points. Currently we're sitting on 146 points. Okay, so you can see the sort of distance that we've got to go, the number of points that we've got to acquire. Now, I've, I've likened what's going on at UWS to Rangers Football Club. So we started in the bottom league, all right? and we're building our way up and it takes time because what happens when you join any sport as a team particularly you start in the lowest possible league and so you have to build up your capability where you go up the leagues where there are more points available so it'll take a little while for us to get up to 50th but it certainly is achievable and this number of points which you saw from the previous table is quite a bit higher than it was the previous year so our progress is compelling and our achievement into that place in the top 50 I have no doubt will be acquired. Now in the coming uh, few weeks, I don't have the exact dates, but Claire Carney, who I think you saw in the room here somewhere, uh, and other colleagues are going to be going around the university talking to you a little bit about uh, TEF. If you don't know what TEF is, um, can I advise you to attend one of those workshops where Claire will go into some detail about what TEF is, uh, what it means to the UK, why we uh, one of 14 universities in Scotland that have decided not to continue participating in TEF for the time being, uh, but may ultimately join it. 
And then there are some of the other challenges which are going on in, this, in the sector um, that, that will affect all of us. And I'm not going to deal with every one of them, but each of those things up there, and there are many others, are some of the pressures which on a daily basis I don't expect will necessarily affect you, but they do affect the university. They are where my colleagues and I spend much of our time trying to position UWS in the right place, ensure that we gain advantage from the work that we do with sector agencies, with our funding bodies, with what's happening out of the various governments, to ensure that our position is heard, that our aspirations are supported, and that the challenges that we face can be reconciled appropriately, if at all possible. Not all of them are possible. This is one of the most challenging at the moment, flat cash. What that means is that between this year and next year, the funding council are giving us no more money. So our costs are going up year on year, but between this year, 16-17, and next year, 17-18, the funding council are not increasing the amount of money we get. What that means is we have to diversify our, our income streams, and that's something that we've been working hard to try and do. We haven't had great success up until now, but certainly with uh, the annual planning process we went through recently, I encourage the deans and directors to understand the fundamental importance of us identifying ways in which we can generate additional sources of income that come into the university for us to be able to do many of the things that we want to achieve. This is a breakdown of finance in the university. Um, this, uh, this diagram from our chief finance director, uh, officer, um, who can probably explain this better than me, but what you see here is the inside circle is where we are at the moment. So if you think of that circle as 100%, that blue line there, which is quite extensive, together with that green bit there, represent the monies that we get from the Scottish Funding Council, the Scottish Government. So it's Scottish Funding Council money, and its tuition fees make up those two sections I've just highlighted there, that one and that one. That's where we are at the moment. So that represents about 80% of our income. And you just heard me say that that figure there is going to be flat cash next year, which means it doesn't get any bigger. So the outside line is where we're trying to get to, which is that the blue part and the green part added to it represent a much smaller part of the total circle. That's what we're trying to do. In other words, improving the amount of non-EU funding we get, the research and enterprise income we get, deferred capital grants and so on. So what we're trying to do is become less reliant on money from the government. Just to give you some idea, this, this figure here represents 80%. St Andrews University have 13% of their income coming from those two sources. 13%, one three. Now I don't ever expect us to get that far across, but I have said it's not unreasonable for us to expect probably somewhere between 30 and 50% of our income to come from other sources than the Scottish Funding Council. So that's why the point I made earlier is important. We must diversify our income if we want to achieve the things that the university is setting out to do. That's a picture there of an artist's impression of what the Lanarkshire campus will look like. Uh, I'm sure you're all fully familiar now with that project, an 85 million pound project that will relocate us from uh, the town centre, more or less, of Hamilton out onto Eco Park on the west side of Hamilton. Uh, that project is well underway. The, oops, um, the, the external infrastructure that will create this is now up. The frame is up and it will be glazed over the next few weeks uh, and so begin to take the shape of what it looks like there. We've been investing across the university though and you can see some of it here. The hub on this campus, the atrium just out here, even this room itself. For those of you that are familiar with the university, this room didn't look like this three years ago. This was a glass wall. It looked outside there to a pit. Um, the stage and the, the infrastructure in here didn't uh, have the same appearance as it does now. The atrium didn't exist out here. The, the hub didn't exist down the back there. Other parts of the university that were improving were not in the state they're in. Now, unfortunately, we don't have infinite amounts of cash to be able to do as many changes as I'd like to, but we will do that. Um, and over the course of time, we'll generate capital which we can use to improve the structure of all the campuses that we operate on. Uh, not just building new ones or taking over new ones like we are in Hamilton. We've got a multi-million pound IT investment project in place. Um, it's a project which was earmarking 12 million pounds to go into IT infrastructure and we've spent about half of that money. Uh, the London campus was launched in 2015. Hello London again. Um, that's been a great success project up until now. 18 months of operation and we are without question the most successful university ever to have opened a campus in London and have the sort of success that we've had in such a short space of time. Many universities have opened in London, 
none of them have had the success that we've had in creating the opportunity to recruit and deliver student programs in the way that we have. We've got somewhere between six, eight, 600 and 800 students on that campus now um, already. There's great success stories right across the university. These are just a few of them. If there are some here, or if there are some missing from here, please let us know because I don't wish to, to miss out things that you think we should be mentioning. But you know, just over the past year, these are some of the things which have been unbelievably important and successful to the university. I think you, you all know that last year we were world ranked for the first time in the top 5% of universities in the world. The top 5% of universities in the world. Just listen to those words, will you? The top 5% of universities in the world. That's where we are now, and we're not ranked in the lower part of that table. We're ranked somewhere between 600 and 800, and when you look at it by universities in the UK, that place is a 64th. Of course, the newspaper league tables in the UK, which just do UK universities, will have us in a different position, but in those league tables, we are the 64th university in the UK, ranked in the top six to 800 in the world, in the top 5%. I won't stop saying that. <laughs> There's another league table coming out in a couple of weeks' time which you'll be interested in looking at as well because it has some positive news for us. It's embargoed for me to tell you what it is, but it comes out on the 6th of April. So on the 6th of April, look out for another league table which is going to show uh, UWS uh, doing something very special. So these are just a few of the things that happened in the past year, um, all of which I believe are incredible success stories, something to be very proud of, and you as staff in the university should feel equally proud as I do of the things that we're achieving. And I, again, gratefully give you my thanks for the work and, and effort that you put in to make these things possible. Now, this year is a reasonably unique year. Um, you, you all know, because I've told you many times, the Gardner Building in the back corner, the home of the School of Business and Enterprise, is the original building of the university. Foundation stone laid by Princess Louise back in 1896. So this year, represents 120 years since we started delivering programs of study on this, on this campus. Uh, with 700 students who occupied that building, uh, with two permanent members of staff, one was the janitor, the other was the principal. All the teaching staff were part-time and doing jobs elsewhere and they would come in and teach. So that's the history to this campus, but also to UWS, 120 years ago. 25 years ago in 1992, we became the University of Paisley, so it's a significant year that we became a university 25 years ago. And then 10 years ago, we changed the name to become the University of the West of Scotland. So it's a, a triple celebration year uh, this year, and uh, many of my colleagues, Catherine, who I can see sitting in the middle there, Donna, who I can't see, but Donna's probably here somewhere, uh, and others are involved in creating an anniversary year of all sorts of things that we're celebrating. So if you've got stuff going on in your school or directorate, that is something that we can badge as an anniversary year celebration, then please let us know because we'll, we'll do that, create some more uh, publicity around it, generate some interest and, and make sure that internally and externally people know of the things that we're doing. So lots of stuff going on this year. The new coat of arms uh, will be released on the 10th of May, I think it is. Um, just to explain what's going on here, the coat of arms that the university did have referenced specifically and only um, Paisley and so we thought it was time that that was modernised and updated so Donna's been working um, quite productively with uh, a chap called the Lord Lyon who oversees this process and it's a, a legally binding process and uh, a new coat of arms has been constructed it's in uh, preparation at the moment to have a shield up here if we get rid of that awful black speaker in the middle up there and it'll go somewhere up there um, <laughs> don't shake your head guys they should have been white in the first place uh, um, and of course, it will begin to appear around the university in all sorts of other places, including merchandising, cufflinks, tie pins, ties, handkerchiefs, uh, and whatever else we can make. So if you've got some ideas about merchandising, please let people know of the thoughts that you have in what we should be doing with that new coat of arms, but it will appear in many and varied places. We've said, and one of our truths is that we want to be different, and you're all part of that difference process. So what is it you can do that will help us make sure that we remain valuable, contemporary, different, but also productive. And these are things which, without wanting to go through any of them individually, are some of the ways in which we can begin to differentiate ourselves by being particularly um, acute in making sure that UWS is the place where these things can happen rather than just talking about them. And I think there's a great future for us in being able to, to do that sort of thing. So I'm going to stop there. Um, in a moment, I'll 
let your individual tables uh, construct a conversation. But before I do that, I just want to do open it up for you to ask me any questions you may have wanted to, make some comments or any observations. But if you have none, then I will quickly pass on to the tables to take over. That's fine. You don't need to ask anything or say anything. Just checking. So there's nobody, nothing. Okay, so London, um, you can uh, now go back to your time together and uh, have your table discussion. And, and here in Paisley, please do the same. I'll come back at the end to see whether there are any comments or questions people wish to raise. Thanks very much. <laughs>